This week's episodes were brought to you by the generous support of Andrew Henninger. Hey folks, Quillyteen here, and welcome to another episode of our Unity Base Building Tutorial, codename Project Porcupine. So, we are now at the point where we're finally going to start implementing A-Star, hooray! We've got a little bit of a test world, theoretically a graph is being constructed. Uh, again, I am recording all of the pathfinding episodes sort of back to back to make sure that they are consistent and coherent, uh, but it does mean there is a possibility that there's something that people spotted from an episode or two ago um, that I haven't yet. There might be some bug outstanding. The world may come crashing down and explode around us. We'll just have to figure it out as we go. So we are now at the point where um, we need to populate this class right here, Path A Star. This is going to be the class that is responsible for actually doing the pathfinding system. So what we're going to do is when we instantiate this, and we're not, we don't have anywhere that's calling this yet, but the idea is once this gets instantiated, it gets past a world, a starting tile, and an ending tile, and then what it's going to do, it's going to internally generate some sort of path, which might be in a queue structure, we're not sure. It's going to generate some sort of path, and then there's going to be some way to like ask, okay, what's the next tile, then the next one, the next one, and get an order of these tiles in a direction that we should move in to get where we want to go. So to do this, we're going to very simply follow the pseudocode that's on Wikipedia. Again, I have said there are, pro there are not probably, there certainly are some very good C-sharp ready and very generic implementations of A-star pathfinding that we could have used for a system that's probably going to be faster, but this is a great learning opportunity, so we're going to do that. All right, now I think what would be kind of cool, let me get rid of the document outline, go away, get rid of the solution, so we've got just as much uh, space here as possible, and let me see if we can't get both on here. Obviously, the pseudocode is going to be a bit small. I'm not going to big in the text because then I wouldn't actually be able to uh, see it. But you guys can have your own copy of it open. Um, and actually, I don't know, maybe that's the best way. But basically, what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to follow along here as much as possible. I got to make it a little wider because the comments are looping in an unappealing manner. There we go. Okay, so one line is basically one line now. All right, so this function a star is basically what our constructor is going to be. So we need to decode this pseudocode into our C sharp language. I'm going to move this just because the moving arrow at the bottom is going to drive me crazy. So we have a some sort of um, variable called close set. It's a set of nodes already evaluated. So that to me, a set in this case, well, there is an actual set um, thing, but we're going to make it a list. This is going to be a list of path nodes of type tile, because that's the kind we're working on. Uh, and we're going to call this, and I'm going to use the exact same variable name that are used here because it's going to be simpler. We might rename them afterwards to, uh, you know, the sort of, um, um, I don't know, convention that we're using for our variable names, but we're going to start with this. So this is going to be a, a new set of nodes. It's going to start off empty. Great. Then we have another set of nodes. Copy this. This is going to be the so-called open set. And one of the reasons I've done Dijkstra's before, it's so easy to explain Dijkstra's. A star is a little bit weirder with the closed set, open set, just some of the terminology that is used. But that's fine. So this is another list of nodes, but it actually doesn't start empty. We get the closed set. The open set gets the starting node in there. Now note that's the starting node, not the starting tile. And actually, let me go and call this tile start tile end to make it explicit. We need the starting node, not the starting tile. Now we can get that because the world has our tile graph in here. And tell you what, for right now I'm going to make this public. We're going to take a little bit of lazy programming. And in here we also have the list of nodes. I'm going to make this public as well. Just a little bit of lazy programming for now. Maybe we'll change things up later. Maybe we'll have an, an accessor, a getter setter. We'll, we'll see how we want to go. But I need the node that belongs to this starting tile. And actually, you know what? What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab basically a copy of this of these nodes over here. And I say, listen, world dot um, a tile graph dot nodes. I'm just going to grab a copy of that. That way I don't have to use this long name every time. This is not particularly inefficient, um, but it's just going to save us a little bit of typing. So we're going to say nodes for the tile start. Boom, done. Uh, we might want to do a check, actually, at this point. If um, nodes.contains 
key tile start is equal to false debug.log error uh, the starting tile isn't in the list of nodes and then just return well yeah return right away in bail that's going to be okay and we'll do a same check for the tile end the ending tile isn't in the list of nodes so presumably we're trying to move uh, to a tile where there's no floor. So that's that's a no-go, that's that's no good whatsoever. But also at this point, tile graph at the first time around is gonna be null, right? If tile graph is equal to null, and in fact, it's gonna become null every single time we invalidate the, the map. We've got a function in here that whenever uh, a tile changes or furniture gets placed, we call invalidate tile graph, which is down here. We just set tile graph to null. So first thing we have to do actually, is we have to check to see if the tile graph is null. If it is, then we have to generate a new one, which is fine because it's path, tile graph, and then we just give it a copy of the world. We generate a new graph. Now, is it slow? Is it fast? We'll figure it out down the road, but we'll make sure on demand we create a tile graph. So we destroy it whenever it needs to be destroyed. We, we create one when we need one at that point, but assuming the world's not changing, then multiple calls to path A star won't recreate the tile graph over and over. So that's going to be all right. Okay, uh, for check to see if we have a valid tile graph. A list or a dictionary, dictionary of all valid walkable nodes. Um, make sure our start end tiles are in the list of nodes and then we start basically the algorithm and I should put in a reference mostly following this pseudo pseudocode boom like that all right so that's good close set open set next thing we have to do came from this is a map a map of navigated nodes. A map in this case is a dictionary. We want a dictionary that goes from one node to another node. And that's what this is. Came from, and it is just an empty map right now. So it's just a, a new dictionary with nothing added to it. Then we've got something called G-score. Map with default value of infinity. So this is a map where the key, unless I'm mistaken, the key is a node and the value of this dictionary is a float in this case. We're going to use a float as opposed to a double. I think floats going to be perfectly fine for our purposes. A float which has, for that tile, for that node, the total distance to get there. And it's going to default to a value of infinity for all things. So we're going to create a, so this is a dictionary. Uh, where the key is a node and the value is a float and it's going to be called G score and we have to instantiate it. Now we could, we've got two approaches here um, to set everything to infinity to start off with. Um, we could just leave it as is, and then when we try to read something from it, if it's a null, then we could, you know, assume infinity or whatever, blah, blah, blah. I think it's probably fine for us at this point if we do something like for each um, path node n in um, nodes.key uh, values. So we're going to loop through all the value, all the nodes that exist. And then in G score, we're going to say for the n this node, we're going to set mathf.infinity. So this, there's a neat little helper over here uh, that is the infinity value for float. Basically, just like, you know, the biggest possible um, positive um, floating point value over here. It just makes sure that if we're looking at a new node, it's going to have such an apocalyptically high cost by default that we're not going to assume that there's a shorter way to there when we're doing some comparisons. A node we've never looked at, we literally don't know how to get there yet, so we assume it has an infinity cost until we know better, until we find a shorter route. So this is also ensure that the G-score dictionary gets fully padded out 
Um, so it will never have a node where we try to look it up in G-score and it's not in the dictionary. It's just going to be there to start off with, which is great. Okay, but then we have to override it. G-score for the starting node. Uh, we don't have a reference to that right now. Um, although it's pretty easy to get. I don't think we have to keep referencing start. So the starting node is just nodes for tile start. We're going to set its cost to zero, obviously. Um, it takes us zero amount of movement to be in the node where we already are. Um, then we've got something called F score, map with a default value of infinity. So to starts off the same as G score, except it's called F score. And we set everything there. Um, so map with the default value of infinity. Um, but then this is used, so we've got for the starting tile, we give it a value from this function here, heuristic cost estimate. So the big difference between the Dijkstra's algorithm and A star is that in A star, we actually try to guess, we make a prediction as to what the cost of, of a tile is. Um, there's probably a really good, well, as I say, a good and succinct um, description of it in here, but I don't think there's anything uh, good or succinct. Well, there's good, but there's not necessarily succinct in here. When you compare the A star one to the Dijkstra's, Dijkstra's will grow. Actually, we can look at that. And we look at that little animated GIF again, right over here. Dijkstra's grows in every single direction. It does guarantee that it will find the shortest route. I don't know if you guys can see that properly. Right? It grows in every direction. And as a result, it will guarantee find the shortest route no matter what. But if we compare that to the A star version, the A star version, uh, let me open it in your window so it starts fresh, will grow towards the goal by default. And then sort of when it hits a wall, it will grow outwards. And then as soon as it finds a way around the wall, it will again grow towards the goal. It assumes that if all things being equal, a tile that is physically just closer to the goal by the crow's flies. And again, A star, when it starts off, it doesn't know anything about obstacles, right? Um, I was trying to refresh this. Oh, there we go. It doesn't know anything about obstacles. It just assumes it's probably a good idea to move towards the goal blindly. And then, you know, pathfind out of there. So we have this heuristic function, which returns the estimated distance from a particular tile to the goal. We estimate the distance. And that means like that when it has to start and it gets a choice of going upwards or up and to the right, well, the up and to the right has a lower estimated distance than this one. So that's, it's using this as a guide. Every now and again, you could, you can create an example uh, map that can fool A star into taking a path that's slightly less optimized than some other route. But most of the time that doesn't happen. And as a result, any, in any case, it has to check far fewer tiles to get to its goal. It doesn't have to scan as much of the map to get there as, as opposed to Dijkstra's. So, that is what this heuristic is there for. Heuristic is just a fancy word in this case of the estimated distance. And in other words, just the actual sort of um, uh, Euclidean distance. Or, well, we're going to go back to that discussion. Euclidean versus Manhattan versus um, uh, the chessboard movement. Chebyshev whatever it's called. So we're going to feed that in. So clearly we need some sort of function here called heuristic cost estimate. And again, for now, I will go and use the exact same, um, the exact same phrasing just to make sure that our pseudocode matches and we'll probably rename stuff. Um, heuristic cost estimate from, um, and let's, let's take in two tiles. So path tile or path node of type tile, and we're going to call it start and then another one of goal. Well, actually, not start, but yeah, whatever, it's fine to go. So this function is going to be really simple. We're just going to re return the Euclidean distance between start and goal in this case, or, you know, point A to point B, something of that nature. And I mean, we know how to do that. That's the, your, um, your Pythagorean formula. We're going to get the hypotenuse of basically this triangle, which means we are returning the mathf.square root of um, a dot data dot x minus b dot data dot x wrap this whole thing 
in mathf.pow. We're doing this to the power of two. And we are adding this, the same thing in the y. So it's the difference in x's squared plus the, dis the difference in y's squared. So basically the length of the horizontal side of the triangle, uh, the square of the length of the horizontal side of the triangle plus the square of the length of the vertical side of the triangle, or height and width if you want, and then the square root of the whole thing, that is the true by the bird's flies Euclidean distance from point A to point B, and we are returning that. This could probably be made faster. We'll leave it in for now. So the heuristic cost estimate here of the starting node, which is node tile start, to the ending node, which is node tile end, or goal. I guess I'm calling it end, but tile goal will be fine. Um, actually, why don't I, again, to be sort of consistent here, why don't I grab those right away? Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Let's do that. Um, over here, after we've got a list of the nodes, let's make a <clears throat> um, path node tile start, which is simply this, then I can use the same terminology as the pseudocode, tile end. So then again, here we're saying we add in start, we add in start, uh, and this is start again, and that value gets set to the heuristic cost estimate from start to goal, like so. Okay. So that was that line. Then we do a loop. While open set is not empty. And it doesn't start off empty. It starts with the starting node in there. So, okay, while open set dot count is greater than zero. Uh, actually, is there not like a dot empty? No, there isn't. Maybe with link, I'm not sure. Dot count is greater than zero. So while the open set is not empty, we're going to do something. We've got, we got to grab something called current. Current um, is a path node type tile current equals the node in open set having the lowest F score value. So this is where our, the pseudocode differs a little bit from the practical implementation that you would use, because here's the thing, right? What we need to do at this point, current is supposed to be the node in open set that has the lowest F score. So F score is a dictionary of every single node that exists entirely. And it just, it's a node linked to a score. So we could find that out. We could have um, a function here that basically loops through every single thing in open set, right? Right now the open set uh, list only has a single value starts. So that would be pretty simple. But later on it could have like a hundred different things in here. I would have to loop through every single one and find the one with the lowest value um, uh, in F score. So for each thing in open set, we look up its F score and then we keep track of which one has the lowest value and then loop through the whole thing and then return sort of the minimum, uh, which you can do. But of course, that's a big search. That is That requires us to loop through everything in the open set, every single loop of this function, which slows it down pretty dramatically. And there's a few things you can optimize sort of just generally speaking with that. Um, you can certainly make it very conven uh, convenient with a link queue sort of command, but ultimately that is still a pretty big search. What you have to do, or what we're going to do to bring this up to a reasonable speed, is instead of implementing open set as a list, we're gonna implement it as a priority queue. So a priority queue, I mean, internally is, is tracked with a heap and, and sort of a different data structure that way. But basically the way that it works in terms of the interface that you have to deal with, the way that it works is when you add things to the list, you don't just add things to the list by itself. You add things to the list and give it a, uh, a number, a priority, where the lower the number is, the effectively the higher the priority. So things with a priority queue number of zero are gonna be right at the top of the list and you can pull that out right away. Whereas the higher the number, the lower down in the queue that it goes. So when you grab the thing at the top of a priority list, priority queue, the topmost item will always be the thing with the smallest priority queue number, which works out well because this whole sort of like F score thing is effectively going to be 
the total distance traveled. So we always want to grab the thing that has the lowest F score number because it represents the tile that is probably um, the the least least walking that has to take part. Um, but it does require that instead of a list over here, we use that. Um, I think the F score is fine. I think it's just the open set that we've got to tweak. So as I said, like a few videos ago, I did include in our project, this priority queue implementation. I've got a link to its GitHub page in the project over here. Again, I'll try to remember to put it down below. It's got two different implementations of priority queue. One is really quite fast, um, but you have to babysit it. You have to sort of grow it and everything. We may end up using it in the future if we want real speed, but we'll use a simple priority queue, which is dead simple and easy to use. Um, you could you can just look at the code and figure out how to use it. Um, there's also the page that you can use, but it's really simple. So we're gonna replace this open set implementation I'm just going to comment it out for now. We're going to replace this with a priority queue instead. So simple, uh, we have to, there's a namespace for it. So let's say using priority queue like that. And then here we can create a simple priority queue. It, it's a generic, so we have to tell what kind of data we're tracking. In this case, just, just like the list. So we're tracking path nodes for tiles like that. I'm going to call this still the open set. And then we're going to create a new, um, oops, new one of these. There we go. We instantiate it. And then just as before, we're going to add the starting node to, th to this. Uh, what do you call it? In queue instead. We're going to add the starting node to this, which is just start. But we have to give it a priority. Now, this is actually going to be the F score. The priority is always, well, it's not, yeah, I think it's always gonna be the F score. Um, and in this case, we're gonna go ahead and just set it to this immediately. I suppose it actually doesn't matter because the very, you know what? Because we're gonna DQ this. So it's the top priority. Hmm, let me, let me load up here just to make sure. Because we remove it, if goalie concurrent, reconstruct path. I mean, in a sense, it kind of doesn't matter. Because most likely it's going to get removed the first time. All right, let's put in a zero. I think, yeah, I don't, I think this is going to be effectively bulletproof. So our open set is still what it was before. It's just a different type of data structure. It starts off with just the smart, the, the starting node in there, but the difference is that we always have to give it a priority here because this way it guarantees that the open set is always sorted for us where the first thing on the list is going to be um, the most minimalist tile, which is good. It's the sort of thing we're going for. So back to the loop over here. It says current is the node in open set having the lowest F score value. Well, in this case, because the priority is always going to be the, um, the F score, we can say open set dot DQ. Now this does remove that node. That is a little bit different from the pseudocode over here. Here, we're not necessarily removing uh, the node from the set until we hit this line. I'm not sure that'll make a difference. We're going to have to check in, um, Actually, totally fine. Because if the only time we're not going to remove the current node from the open set is if the current node is equal to the goal, in which case we call return a reconstruct path and then return right away. Reconstruct path does not use the open set um, list at all. So it literally doesn't matter. Equivalently, and it might be a little bit more clear, honestly, if open set this line here were just moved on top of the if check because mechanically it works exactly the same and that way it will be a little bit more clear no matter what um, kind of data you're using for a data structure you're using for open set. Okay, so in any case, we are fine here. So we are going to DQ the thing with the lowest and then if current, if this current node is the same as our goal node, then to do um, return reconstruct construct path. So we have to we have to do something. This is where we're supposed to bail. Uh, but for now, we can just return. Actually, we don't have to return anything, but we should reconstruct the path. But we do bail at this point, and that's going to be fine. Okay, 
So assuming that our current node is not the goal node, then we have some work to do. This is the step where it says we would remove the open the, the current node from the open set, but that's already been done for us because of the DQ. And then in the closed set, we are going to add uh, current, the current node to the closed set, done. And then for each neighbor of current, well, what does that mean? That means for each path edge, uh, what are you calling it? Neighbor. Spelled in the American way. Uh, in current dot edges. There you go. So for each neighbor connected to our current node, we're going to do something. If neighbor uh, is in, okay, I spell it differently. We're going to check, is the neighbor in the closed set? So if closed set dot contains neighbor, and I'm being explicit with equal true, even though it's completely unnecessary, then what do we do? We continue. Um, ignore this already completed neighbor. This will just loop us. This will just skip to the next for each in the sequence. There we go. So to fix that. I think we deleted something accidentally. So if this neighbor is already in the closed set, okay, we, we don't, we, we don't continue. Continue means it like, it doesn't continue the rest of the loop. It just goes to the next step in the loop. Um, so then we need a, I guess a float called tentative G score which is the G score of our current node plus some sort of function called distance between current comma neighbor. Let's make a function for that. You can sort of use the heuristic cost estimate, but we can probably save a tiny bit of uh, calculation here. Uh, dist between um, A and B. So let's go and complete this line and then make the function work. Dist between current comma neighbor. So that's the tentative G score. So what is the distance between these two nodes? Well, it so happens we can make a few little assumptions because we're working on a grid. We know the distance is either going to be one if they're vertical or horizontal, or it's going to be assuming we're using the Euclidean distance one point. 414 ish if it's diagonal, right? Square root of two. Square root of two. Yeah, and that means we can actually hard code that in. Instead of doing one of these sort of calculations, we can kind of do a really simple check. We already have, where? In our tile code. We have some good neighbor calculation code in here now, right? For is neighbor, we went and worked that out recently. Da, 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 um, over here. All right. We can make assumptions because we know we're on a grid. Actually, do we? I mean, we do, but path A star, we assume tiles and tile graph. Yeah, okay. We might have to change this later because we know we're working on a grid at this point. So, hori slash vert neighbors have a distance of one. Diagonal neighbors have a distance of this. Oh, the copy paste is broken. Of course it is. Because it's been 15 seconds and therefore mono develop has to break. Grrr. Let's try this again. Reopen, 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 reopen. And where are we as a distance of? Whoa! That's interesting. Why is it? Uh... There it is. Okay. Excellent. Where's my other window? And then we can embiggen this and do that. All right. So we can use this as a bit of a shortcut. Maybe there's another way to optimize it, but that's going to be fine. So. If this, then return one. So this is the test 
uh, to see if two tiles are neighbors. If this is true, um, I mean, technically this returns the distance. This only, um, and this will always work, I think, for Manhattan distance. You, we could just return this directly, and that would return the correct distance between two nodes. Um, so instead, it's going to be a.data.x and a.data.y, and then it's b.data.x and b.data.y. Return this. And diagonal neighbors, and basically I'm doing this, instead of calculating it for reals, I'm doing it so that we can avoid a, a sort of a square root calculation here because we just know what a diagonal value will be. So the diagonal ones are this over here. If this is equal to one and that is equal to one, and I know uh, someone pointed out that you could do a little multiplication here too, that works out very nicely. But if those are equal to each other, then we can return this value here. And I think this works. Um, so we can copy paste, copy paste, and I suspect this might be an area where someone points out a bug. Um, otherwise, otherwise, do the actual math, which is this. You know, maybe it's faster to just do this directly and avoid these checks. Maybe there's another way to optimize it. Um, I probably should have just done this. Honestly, as part of the theory of like trying to keep the source code as clear as possible. But, um, I think, I don't know, maybe it doesn't matter. Anyway, now we have a way to, to calculate the distance between two nodes, right? This will return the correct distance between two nodes, I guess. All right, um, distance between. So we have a tentative G score over here. And then if open set dot contains neighbor equals false. Right? This is this line here. If neighbor not in open set. Then, because we're discovering a new node, open set dot uh, in queue neighbor, although it's gonna have to be with its um with its new S score. So we need to know the F core score first. Yeah, we do. Because when we enqueue this, we enqueue it with the f-score. So we need to do the calculation of the f-score first. Um, we need the... Uh, I guess we could do it inside of there. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so the f-score for the neighbor is equal to the g-score of the neighbor. I guess we do all of this. Yeah, because... Well, this happens no matter what. It just doesn't necessarily get added. Okay, let's let's change the logic here a little bit. So, what we're going to do is we're going to do this bailout first, which means if open set dot contains neighbor and tentative g score is greater or equal than g score of neighbor, then we continue. Because that's what happens here. If, right, because we do this, so let's do the invert, right? So if it is an open set, because this, this bit here only runs if it is in the open set, because if it's not in the open set, this happens else something else. So we say instead, if it is in the open set and this, then we continue. Otherwise, we know this code has to run no matter what. So came from neighbor is equal to current. This is a map that tells us like which tile we come from in, in with different scores. G score of neighbor 
is equal to the tentative g-score. And f-score of neighbor is equal to the g-score of neighbor. So I believe the g-score is the actual distance it took to walk to this neighbor. Okay, the g-score is the actual distance to walk to the neighbor, and the f-score is the assumption, the distance we have walked to get to this neighbor plus our heuristic. So in other words, in the end, this is what the f-score is what we assume the total cost to get to our goal by walking through this tile is going to be. And the total cost to get to our goal by walking through this tile is the cost we know it took to get to this tile plus the estimated distance to finish the way. So that's neighbor to goal, like that. Then we can finish this bit where we add it to the open set. If open set dot contains neighbor is equal to false, then open set dot add or in queue, sorry, dot in queue neighbor, and that's based on its F score. So that way it guarantees the thing with the least F score is going to be at the top of the open set. So we have to change our order a little bit here just because, I mean, if we were brute forcing this, if this line here, if we were calculating this on the fly, then everything would be fine. But because we don't want to calculate on the fly, we'd rather use a priority queue because it's way faster. It means we just have to calculate things in a slightly different order. But equivalently, we should be doing the same amount of work again, unless I've put in some sort of catastrophic bug. But that's that. That is this this whole for each neighbor of current. That's this whole bit. Um, and then, yeah, because there's no like end of loop, uh, normally the return is here. So this is where we would return. This is where we, we, we want to end. This is our success. When our current node is equal to our goal, we have some sort of success. We'll have to reconstruct the correct path at that point, but this is where we bail. So it means at the end of this while loop over here, that's the end of our while loop. This is the end of our uh, for each neighbor, right? If we reached here, it means that we burned through the entire open set without ever reaching a point where current equals goal. This can, this happens when there is no path from start to goal. Uh, so there's a wall or missing floor or something. So um, the algorithm says here says return fail. In this case, we just sort of just exit. We don't have a uh, failure state. Maybe it's just that the uh, path list will be null. So basically, we can, we'll be able to construct this, we'll be able to run this constructor, but we've never assigned path. And so our pathfinding system, say over here, right, where we get next tile, we get path.dq, well, path could be null. We've got to check to see if path is null um, to see if we successfully found a route from point A to point B from our start to our goal. But I think at this point, this code is done. So now the question is our reconstruct path over here. So we have a function. So I have a void, that's going to be fine. It doesn't have to be public or anything like that. It's going to be called reconstruct path. It's going to take in our came from map. So our came from map is right over here. It's going to take in something called came from, and it's going to have the same structure as the other one. And it's also going to accept uh, current, which is simply a node. So in this case, so at this point, current is the goal. So what we want to do is walk backwards through the came from 
map until we reach the end of that map, which will be our starting node. Huge success. And that's all we do at that point. And that's what this uh, code is here. We've got uh, some something they're calling total path over here. I guess for completion's sake. Actually, we'll make a new one. That's going to be okay. Um, can I invert a, a Q? Q total path. Um, total path dot reverse isn't a thing. But what if I include link? Uh, was it using system dot link? I'm going to assume that we can invert a Q. Uh, Q of... Actually, at this point, it's just going to be a Q of tiles. We don't want the nodes, just a Q of tiles. Total path dot reverse. That works. Cool. Okay. Because we're going to be building this reconstruct path, we build it backwards. Uh, with, with the Q. Because... Yeah, okay, we'll get through it. Anyway, while uh, current, or while came from dot contains key current, um, yeah, while came from contains key current, We say current is equal to came from current. So what came from is it's a map that says um, for the key. So came from is a map where the key value relation is really saying some node we got there from this node. So what we're doing by doing this is we're backtracking. We're setting current to the previous node in the sequence. And our total path, we are going to enqueue current. Uh, oh, so total path dot in queue current over here. Uh, th the final uh, step in the path is the goal. So total path at this point has one tile on it, which happens to be the, the final goal, the, the goal tile. The, the one at the very end that are, is our target, right? And then what we do is we find out, hey, this goal tile, how did we get there? Well, we got there from came here, came from. If we feed in a tile here, it returns the tile that we got there from. So that we're setting current to that new tile. And then we're enqueuing this. The first pass through, this is going to be the tile immediately before the goal tile. And then we're just going to keep lo looting, or looping through there until we... Um, Until what? Until current is equal to a tile where we never got there from anywhere, which is our starting tile. Because if we look, so we got our start tile, which is here, and then came from gets set up here. The only time we ever add something to came from is when we process neighbors, which means the starting tile never gets added to the came from dictionary, which means at some point when we're working our way backwards, at some point current, which got set here and still got enqueued, <clears throat> right? We enqueued current, but at some point this current that we added to the queue is our starting tile and our starting tile, we never came from anywhere to get to our starting tile. We just instantly starting there. So this is going to return false at which point it will end. So. At this point, total path is a queue um, that is running backwards from the end 
tile to the start tile. So let's reverse it. So because we have link, we can go total path dot reverse. Now that returns a new version. So what we want to really do is set path, which is right over here, our global one to that. Or we could reassign it, or we could do all kinds of different stuff. I guess we'll just do it this way. We'll set we'll set path, which is our class member, to the reverse of the total path, because again, the the path gets built in reverse order. So we don't actually call this yet. We want to do that right here. Reconstruct path. So we feed it the came from and the current node like that. And then we bail. We have reached our goal. Let's convert this into an actual sequence of tiles to walk on, then um, end this constructor function. There we go. All right, so it's a pretty long uh, function here, partially because we've been extra verbose, but partially because it sort of, you know, is a relatively long function here. Um, the odds that I have done this without making at least 15 catastrophic errors is pretty damn low. I'll be pretty impressed if there wasn't any syntax errors, but there is. Um, generic list does not contain member contains. Wait, what? It's not a generic list, though. Oh, is it because there's an overloaded method now with link? Hang on, what? One second. Let me get rid of link. And let me get rid of the reverse over here. Oh, I'm feeding in something wrong. What is closed set? It's the wrong type of um, variable. Uh, closed set path node tile. And I'm checking to see if it contains oh an edge. Ah, um, right. So neighbor dot node is what I need to be comparing it to. That's the problem there. I'm trying to see if closed set contains I was containing an edge, where really what I had to do is check to see if the closed set contained a node. So that's that. There's probably a bunch exactly like that. Yeah, because neighbor, that's the problem. I'm treating um, all of these have to be changed over, because neighbor is supposed to just be a node. You know what's be better then? Hold on. Um, edge neighbor, and let me make a path path node tile called neighbor, which is edge neighbor dot node. There we go. That way I can just stay consistent with the pseudocode as much as possible. Okay. So all those was mostly because I am using, um, I was using an edge instead of a node. We got another overload right over here. Total path. Ah, oh, it just wants a tile, right? Current dot data. Because we don't care. We're going to be um, the pathfinding system is going to be pulled for which tile is supposed to be the next tile in the path. And use of unassigned local or total path over here. Oh yeah, this is going to be equals new. Boom. Thank you very much for that notice. And then that should get rid of all the syntax errors. Nope, another one over here. Ah, yes, because we want to queue up data. There we go. And then we've got to actually assign path to the total path that reverse, and we can reintroduce the link, which was not the cause of the problem, but was just making the error a little harder to read. Um,
cannot convert to a Q. Wait, what? Because it is a Q. And I'm reversing it, but this doesn't, like... What is this returning? Cannot implicitly convert system collection generic enumerable tile to Q. Uh, so this returns a sort of generic. Uh, if I force you to return a list, would you then... Or an array? Because it's returning a different type. Oh yeah, uh, what if I did new Q of type tile, and presumably I can feed in something here. Yeah, a collection. That's probably gonna make you happy. Excellent, okay. So this is a little bit, that does mean we're creating a Q here, um, and then we're creating a brand new Q, which I guess is what reverse always does. And then this version will get a garbage collected. I wonder if there's a way to reverse the queue without causing a new um, a new object. I guess not. Even I'm thinking about ways of implementing it. I guess you're always creating some new data structure to hold the reversed queue. Okay, but in any case, at this point, the path should now go from starting tile to ending tile, which sort of means you could probably drop the first tile. I'm pretty sure, assuming I've read all this correctly, I'm pretty sure the first thing in this path will actually be the... Um, uh, the starting tile, which makes it a little bit redundant, but that's okay. We can just burn it off right away, and that's okay. So, what's next? Well, we don't actually call this anywhere yet. So we should probably do that and see exactly what happens. Well, I guess this video has gone on long enough. Next video, we will try to call this. Uh, specifically, we'll call this from the character. The character will pull a job off the queue. And we'll see if the character can walk there or not and see exactly what this returns and probably find about a million bugs. Next up, so the actual character implementation, you know, making the character use the pathfinding system is actually going to be very, very, very simple. The hard part will be going and debugging all of this stuff. So hang on to your knickers. It's going to be an exciting ride. Thanks for watching, folks. See you next time. Thank you very much to all our January supporters over at patreon.com slash quill18creates and these mic check supporters. We've got Alexander Gutler, Andre Odendal, Neil Blakely Milner, Speedy Savant, Valiant Cake Fiend, Aaron Toyson, Marius Field Vold, Disco Geek, Ole Peter Talgo, Julian Auger Lafont, or Auger Lafont, I should say, Stephen Stagger, Michael McClintock, Kale the Quick, Drazion, Wes Oldenboving, Craig Mortel, Nail or Nale, I don't know, Vickstrom, and Andrew Henninger, and everyone who has watched, shared, favorited, and subscribed to these videos, and left comments as well. You guys really keep things going. Thank you very much for watching.